Hello and welcome to your recipe for financial success with me, Emma, and my colleagues, Becky and Julie. In each episode, we'll be bringing you a list of ingredients to help you cook up a storm and master methods to finesse your finances. We'll be helping you expand your repertoire and hopefully teach you a few new skills along the way. So, clear the counters and get your mixing bowls ready for today's recipe. Let's get started. Did you both have fun playing in the snow last week? Not going to lie, I did build a snowman. Well, I was too busy worrying about how on earth I was going to get to work in all that snow. Work from home. And who's going to deal with the post, Emma? Oh, very true, very true. Yeah, unfortunately, I am needed to be here. That's that key worker part, so. I am slightly upset. I just said to Becky that I really wish I'd have tried building an igloo. There was a really cool one in our village. I mean, it must have spent hours and hours making it. Um, but yeah, it was photographs of it on our, um, we've got like a Facebook village group. Mm-hmm. And they were like, it was superbly made. They must have spent hours out there. They must have been freezing cold. I suspect the little and slept well that night. Definitely. I must admit, I found the sneaky trick of you put snow in a lunchbox to make the bricks. I always wondered how they did it. But... Ah, okay. Well, I'll try and find out because I know the person who made it. So I will find out how they did it. We just need some more snow now and I'll give it a go. But woke up this morning and it's gone. Well, you say that. I just um, drove into the office and I had snow in two different places on my way in. Really? On the on the road and up the banks. I'm surprised. Well, the road was shut, so I was on some really like back road in the middle of nowhere. So, Anyway, shall we actually get on with what we're doing today? Absolutely. Go on, Becky. Introduce it for us today. Well, in this week's episode, we are tempting your taste buds with a little tipple of funds Ooh. so try saying that after a tipple of some drink <laughs> does that mean we're having a drink becky not at the minute <laughs> cup of tea yeah yes yeah, cup of tea though i'm gonna get a right reputation for being a bit of an alky i think so so um i know we've talked about pensions and ices in past episodes um and there's lots of different types of investments but the funds we're talking about today are basically what are held within those investments So, Emma, do you want to tell us what is a fund exactly? Okay, thanks, Julie, for getting me kicked off there. A fund is basically where lots of people pull their money into it, so you're not investing in something on your own, um, and you basically all put a little bit of your money in there, and then there's a fund manager that chooses where to invest that money. So you don't have to choose all the stocks yourself of where it's going to go. The fund manager does that part for you. So something that I always ask clients when we're looking at investments is a few things here. So, Becky, do you reckon you can tell me what a share is? I think I might be able to manage that one. Go on. So, a share is a is a part of a company. So, when you buy a share, you buy a part of the company. You buy a share of ownership in that company. Very good. And then, who knows what a dividend is? Oh, I know this one. So, a dividend is what you get paid out from the company profits. I think that kind of covers it, really, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, so can it be sometimes monthly, sometimes yearly? It just depends on how the company works as to when they pay them out. And how, depending on how many shares you have will depend on how much dividend you get paid. Very good. And therefore, a share can go up and down in value with the with the value of the company. Um, so at different times, you can make and lose money. So it's a really good um, basis to kind of know that when you're investing, Um to know that your funds are going to go up and down in value because of the shares held within them. So why would you have a fund then rather than just like investing in shares directly yourself? You could invest in shares directly yourself if you wish to, um, but there's obviously lots of um, knowledge that goes behind that. It does tend to be a higher risk to invest directly into those shares yourself rather than in the pooled investment. Um, But we're going to talk about risk another day, so we're not going to go into too much detail about that. We'll explain that one later. So... Back to funds. So the fund manager choose what to do with your money um, and they have basically strict rules that they have to work within of where to put your money. So if you invest a thousand pounds, they can't just decide what to do with that money completely freely. So it can't go in the Julie holiday fund if Julie's the fund manager. Damn. Nice try. (laughs) So there's strict rules. So they all have their own set of rules and Um, guidelines of what they work within but it could be that they're only able to invest in the UK or China or it could be global it might be that they've got a restriction on how many holdings they can have within that that um, 
particular fund so that it might be they can only hold say 30 shares at one time as a maximum um, or it might be that they can only invest in companies that are valued over a certain amount so it could be that they can only invest in companies that are say worth five million pounds or above so there's lots and lots of different things um, but sometimes they can be even more restricted so it might be that they only invest in things that support something like renewable energy or it could be in a physical asset rather than company so it could be in gold or property something like that oh so how many funds are there emma out there well i did do a quick little google search earlier because i'm sure that this question was going to pop up so the list i searched earlier showed almost nine thousand funds to choose from obviously some of them are restricted so you can't have them in certain investments or something like that but 9,000. Isn't that a huge amount? So is that across the world or is that just in the UK? No, that was across the world that it came up. So, so many different ones and obviously they all do something different. So it's like searching a jar of hundreds and thousands to find the right one. I like that analogy. (laughs) Not going to lie, I had a jar of hundreds and thousands the other day that had all different shapes in it and I just wanted one particular shape and I did stand sorting out those hundreds and thousands. (laughs) Dedication, I like it. Indeed. (laughs) So have you ever heard somebody say, I don't want all of my eggs in one basket? Yes, I have. Do you know what they mean by that? So when we're talking about investing, if you say you don't want all of your eggs in one basket, it means that you don't want all of your money invested in one area. So for example, I don't want all of my money solely invested in UK companies. That's a really good way of putting it, Becky. Why, thank you. (laughs) So that's something we call diversification, so spreading your money out so it's in lots of different places. Um, But again, we're going to come on to that another week because that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about asset allocation. So is it possible then, if I have two, let's say going back to my UK equity example, Mm -hmm. if I have two different UK equity funds within my portfolio, would they both be invested in exactly the same UK companies? Or would one invest in, say, British Gas and the other invest in a another UK-based company, which has completely gone out of my head right now? Mark Suspenses, BP, <laughs> no, Shell. Yeah, any of them. Any of the above would do. <laughs> so, not necessarily. Again, as I said earlier, the, the fund manager, the actual fund will have a remit. So the UK equity fund one could have um, a different remit to the the other. So they might not have the same funds in them. So even having more than one UK equity fund, you could be spreading your money about in more places than you realise. So can you tell which, can you do like a calculation or how do you work out what's in each fund? So you can um, look on websites. So the the fund manager will have a fact sheet that will tell you all about that fund. Um, They don't always... um, necessarily up front show you every single holding but the top 10 holdings will definitely be on everything you see um so you can have a look to see exactly what's in there excellent so shall we move away from risk and asset allocation and get stuck into some funds oh yes please what's next so have you ever heard of active and passive funds yes i have julie do you know anything about active funds yes i do so um So active funds, it was what they call when it's actively managed, which means the manager and their team behind the manager, they're actively looking to buy and sell funds within or shares within the fund and actively watching what's actually happening. So, for example, if they have a goal to outperform the FTSE 100, they'll buy or sell or hold stock to help them to try and achieve that. So and normally it's slightly more expensive to hold an actively managed fund than it is to hold at any other sort of fund. I guess that's because of the extra manpower behind the fund. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Yeah, I mean, there is some um, some sort of argument really on whether or not an actively managed fund makes more money than a passively managed fund. But that's definitely a discussion for another day. But um, an active fund is usually more expensive than a passively managed fund. So Becky, if Julie knows all about the active funds. Do you know about the passive ones? Yes, I do. So a passive fund, as a rule isn't an active fund so you won't have that same actively managed supervision on a passive fund Um, and as a rule they're designed to track an investment or a market index so such as the FTSE 100 and I'm going to come back to that 
once I've described what a passive fund is, because if not, I will end up going up on a massive tangent and then forgetting what I'm talking about. That's fine. Carry uh, on. So the passive fund um, will be designed to track the index or the benchmark as closely as possible. So it won't be there won't be any sort of buys and sells on a on a regular basis. Like Julie said, it'll just be set to track what what that index or what that benchmark is doing. So that'll usually be done by a computer algorithm mm -hmm. uh, and that will sort of mirror what that index or what that benchmark is doing to keep that passive fund in line with with the index or benchmark. Um, as a rule, they tend to be cheaper than actively managed funds. Um, again, we've already covered this, but I guess it's because uh, there isn't that, that active supervision of them um, from the fund manager. Mm -hmm. So you said you were going to come back to what an index or bench benchmark is, Becky. Can you tell us that one? Yes. So we'll use the FTSE 100 as my example of an index to start with. So the FTSE 100 is made up of uh, the top 100 companies on the uh, London stock market. So the 100 biggest companies on the London stock market. So if, for, for the sake of my maths, say I had £100 and I wanted to invest in the FTSE 100, I could buy one pound into each 100 of those companies. And then I'm invested in the FTSE 100. So that 100 pounds would follow the FTSE 100 there or thereabouts what it's doing. And that would be my index. I see. And there's other indexes like the S&P 500? There is. So that's the American one. There's the, um, I think it's the Nikkei yep. in... Uh, Japan there are there are indexes all over the world and there's not just the FTSE 100 we've said about the FTSE 100 um you can also have the FTSE 250 so Julie I can see you're you're chomping at the bit to get back on the mic uh so do you want to explain what a benchmark is Yes, I can, Becky. So a benchmark is when you take all the funds which invest in um, a similar category. So, for example, UK equities, and they're all basically tracked and or they're actually all plotted on the graph. And the benchmark is the average of those funds. So it will then show you that the UK equity fund as a, a ca category as a whole is, is doing X amount. So you'll be able to see whether the UK fund, the equity fund you're looking at is performing above or below the benchmark. So it's basically just um, to kind of give you a guide of where you are in relation to something else, isn't it? Yeah, essentially, yes. And another really good thing about using a, a fund and a fund manager to, to invest your money is that sometimes um, you might have to have a minimum amount to invest in things. Whereas if you use a fund and pull your money in with somebody else or lots of other people, it can give you access to, to different things that you might not be able to invest in on your own. So I had a little look into a fund earlier. You mentioned um, how can you find out what the shareholdings are. I had a look at a UK equity fund, um, which is called Lion Trust Special Situations. And I thought I'd have a little look to see what shares were inside that. So one of them I found was Diageo. Do you know what that is? Are they something to do with Guinness? Yes, they are. Um, Royal Dutch Shell is another one in there. Unilever. And I then had a look on their little products to see what things they make. So they make um, Hellman's Mayonnaise, Magnums, PG Tips, Dove. So they basically um, are a produce company. BP is in there as well. And if I can pronounce it properly, I should have chosen an easier one to pronounce, um, is GlaxoSmithKline, which is a pharmaceutical company. So there's a, a, a massive array of different things in there. So although they're in a category of the UK equities, it's not tied to one type of product because obviously you've got oil there, um, you've got Guinness, and um, obviously things like um, yeah, products like Dove and things like that. So it's, it's a good mix within the actual fund itself. Yeah, and obviously, as long as the, the fund remit allows them to do that, they can invest in any of those different things to, to give that diversification within the fund. So if you have a look online, there are loads and loads and loads and loads of different websites that will all give you different information. Um, one of the websites we like to use is called Trustnet because it's then completely impartial and they're um, not biased to anyone in particular. So you can find lots of different information on there. And 
they will all show you um, kind of their track record and the, the history of the fund. But just remember that past performance is no guide to the future. So um, just because it's done really well in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to continue to do so. We're going to be able to talk about that more in asset allocation, aren't we, Emma, which I'm really excited about. It's one of my favourite topics. Ooh, maybe Julie can take the lead on that one for us, Becky. <laughs> um, so I thought I'd just... Um, give you a few pointers to look out for when you are having a look at um, funds online or anything. Um, So one good thing to keep an eye on is how long has the fund been running for and when did it start? So has it only been about five minutes? So is it kind of a reliable fund? Or did it suddenly appear after a market crash because sometimes um, they can pop up at that that point because it's an easy time to get into the market and it but it might not be reliable. Obviously, don't take my word for that because some funds that have been running a short amount of time can be a very good fund to invest in but it's just something to to kind of look out for on that note emma do you want to tell our listeners about neil woodford i can tell them about neil woodford i'm glad you asked becky because i was thinking oh neil woodford can we talk about him it's a good story there isn't it i think so so um neil woodford was the fund manager for invesco perpetual high income fund and He was a a very successful fund manager there and had a lot of money under management. um, And it's a very, very successful fund. Um, But Neil decided to leave and set up his own fund, which was called Woodford Equity Income. I'm getting lots of nods around, so I know I've got the right fund there. Um, And he went on and started up on his own. He left his uh, management team at Invesco Perpetual and started with a new team and Um, started up a new fund now because he'd been so successful um, lots and lots of investors thought oh Neil started his own fund I'm going to go invest there so all of a sudden he had a huge amount of money flooded into his fund that maybe he wasn't quite prepared for and maybe he started doing things that he shouldn't have been doing that weren't quite within his remit and what then happened after not particularly long time I think it was a year maybe two years of running that fund um, the the fund couldn't couldn't manage anymore, and it ended up closing, and lots of people's money was stuck within that fund, and even to this day, it hasn't reopened um, to allow people to get the money out. Obviously, it's fallen in value, um, so people have, have lost a considerable amount of money. So it's, it's just one of those things. Just because he had a very long track record as the Invesco manager, starting up on his own didn't actually mean anything because he had a new team, a new remit, a new fund that actually that that didn't transfer over, which unfortunately didn't work out for a lot of people. I think it's a really interesting story. And just for our listeners, when you say the fund is closed, Emma, what do you mean by that? So nobody can put any money into that fund and nobody can take any money out of that fund at all. So it is suspended there until the the assets within there can be liquidated so say it's in property that that property needs to be sold to be able to release that money to um, investors but obviously as they're needing to sell it quite quickly to be able to realize that it can then be sold at a, a massive loss compared to what they bought it for which is why obviously and presumably that's then reflected in the uh, share price exactly so you're going to get less out than you you first put back in there interesting thanks for that That's okay. So I think it's safe to say funds are quite a minefield if you don't know what you're doing or don't don't know how to interpret the information in front of you. um, It's quite a difficult task. So it's definitely one of those things. If you don't know, it's definitely worth taking advice on this area. No, definitely. One of the other funds, which hasn't been around for a little while now, so we're going back a few years, but it was the uh, it was the world's most best performing funds for 15 years. Which one's that? The um, JPM Natural Resources Fund. Isn't that one of your favourites, Julie? Yeah, 15 years ago, it was definitely one of my favourites. However, it's not so much one of my favourites, or hasn't been one of my favourites for the last 15 years, when in 2008, it never really recovered. So um, really? just goes to show that just past performance, it's really important not to rely on that because... As I say, it was the best performing fund for 15 years. And in 2008, um, that all changed. And it's never really recovered to its former glory. Don't quote me on it, but there's a, I think it may be a 10 or 15 year period. And the JPM fund that Julie's talking about returned about 700% over that period. So that's crazy. I mean, in its day, it was an amazing fund. But it just shows, well, we'll talk about diversification another day, but it just shows not to put all your eggs in one basket. Most definitely. And I think that's a very good note to leave it on today, Julie. 
And with that, we've completed today's recipe. We hope you have enjoyed following along with us today and cooking yourself one recipe closer to a financially secure future. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, you can head over to www.recipeforfinancialsuccess.co.uk where you can find out more information and a full list of ingredients from today's recipe. For more hints, tips and tasters, find us on Facebook at Your Recipe for Financial Success. If you'd like to get more involved, share your own experiences and learn from a friendly community on a similar journey to you, why not join us in our new Facebook group, The Money Compass, where we will support you to navigate your way to financial success. Thank you for listening and see you next time.